A lovely biography by Richard Davenport Hines, Universal Man, The Life of John Maynard Keynes. You can see the ISBN number here and advanced prices. And I read from the cover that John Maynard Keynes was the 20th century's most influential economist. His theories were the underpinnings of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal and instructed Western nations on how to ward off revolutionary unrest, economic instability, high unemployment, and social dissolution. Keynes was nothing less than the Adam Smith of his time. His the general theory of employment, interest in money became as important in the 20th century as Smith's The Wealth of Nations was in the 18th. Now, in the long wake of the 2008 global economic collapse, Keynesian economics is once again reshaping our world. In Universal Man, the acclaimed historian Richard Davenport Hines offers the first biography of Keynes that reveals the man in full, like many Englishmen of his class and era. Keynes compartmentalized his life <coughs> accordingly. Davenport Hines treats Keynes in turn as a youthful prodigy, a powerful government official, an influential public man, a bisexual living in the shadow of Oscar Wilde's persecutions, a devotee of the arts, an international statement, statesman of worldwide renown. Delving into Keynes's experience and thought, Davenport shows us a uh, a man who was equally at ease socializing with the Bloomberry group as he was persuading uh, heads of states adopt his policies. Through Davenport Hines nuanced portrait we come to understand not just the most enduringly influential economist of the modern era but one of the most gifted and vital men of our times. A disciplined logician with a capacity for glee, who persuaded people, seduced them, subverted old ideas and installed new ones. Engaging, learned and sparkling with wit and insight, Universal Man is the perfect match perfect match for its brilliant subject. I'm going to read the contents as chapter number one is altruist, chapter two is about the boy prodigy that he was, chapter three official, chapter four public man, chapter five the lover, chapter six connoisseur, chapter seven envoy. That's how he has categorized the his writings into these seven chapters on Keynes. And I'm reading from the first chapter, seven snapshots of a universal man. An intellectual in his 20s in college rooms in Cambridge, hunched forward, listening, lolling back in reflection, then standing on an earth rug, speaking, eager, testing, provoking, always in passionate lucid paragraphs to the secretive discussion groups called the Apostles. That's the first paragraph. Then he talks about a man of, uh, this is about 20s. Then he talks about a man of 31 perched in the sidecar of a motorbike driven by his brother-in-law hurtling at top speed on the dusty, hot roads from Cambridge to London. 
the young man is Cambridge economist and has been summoned to the Treasury to help with the crisis caused by the looming European war. Then less than four years later, during a critical phase of the world war, the Treasury official responsible for the government's external financing finances persuading the hard-bitten and visually insensitive Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, it goes on like that. You must read. I'm just reading uh, just to give you a bait to do that. And then he writes on in the next page. <clears throat> a man in his 40s, a member of the Bloomsbury Group, uh, art collector, bibliophile, magazine proprietor, ballot ballot domain and husband of a dancer uh, named Lida Lopokova stumping round England on behalf of liberal candidates during general elections explaining taxation to Blackburn cotton operatives uh, read about that okay. then we have a man in his 50s who knows the creativity of inconsistency and defines someone of perfect consistency as the man who has his umbrella up whether it rains or not revises his ideas and publishes his general theory of employment interest in money in 1936. This founding text, uh, if not the absolutely original creator of macroeconomics, because the most important economics book of the, or rather becomes the most important economics book of the 20th century. It provide, it proves as important as Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations in inaugurating an economic era, we were pedestrian, perhaps a little complacent, said E.C. Pigou, a senior Cambridge economist who often resisted his ideas. General theory broke resoundingly that dogmatic slumber, whether in agreement or in disagreement with him discussion and controversy sprang up and spread over the world. Economics and economists came alive. The period of tranquility was ended. A period of creative thought was born. Then we have, uh, again, I'm just reading, a dauntless man in his 60s a weary titan with heart disease, fighting daily an interminable, closely argued and exhausting, exhausting conferences to save impoverished, war-wrecked Britain from being driven into bankruptcy by the Americans calling in their war loans knowing that he is sacrificing his life in the effort. And then, in mid-Atlantic on the liner Queen Elizabeth, while his exhausted colleagues are asleep, padding down the corridor to the radio room to collect messages reporting how his Anglo-American financial settlement is being decried in England and retreating to his stateroom to prepare the speech of his lifetime, which will send him, which will send his attackers scuttling into retreat. Each snapshot shows the same man in similar postures, a disciplined logician with a capacity for glee, who persuades people, who persuaded people, seduced them, subverted old ideas, installed new ones. A man whose high brilliance did not give people vertical, 
but clarified and lengthened their perspectives. That man was John Maynard Keynes. So don't you see the way so interestingly it's written here? So uh, Keynes was the chief intellectual influence on English public life in the 20th century. He was England's paramount example of the scholar as a man of action. He conceived economic theories in the solitude of his study and in the cut and the thrust of discussion. Then, then he persuaded the politicians and financiers of two continents to implement them. So that was it. I found this very interesting. No account of his persuasive past can omit a description of his voice. Austin Robinson, who worked with him in Cambridge seminars, official meetings and international and diplomatic negotiation, stressed the sound uh, stressed the sound of Keynes. The that beautiful musical resonant, resonant voice allied to an unparalleled power of lucid exposition and to a range of vocabulary and a joy in words comp comparable only to the to that of Winston Churchill in his generation made him a pleasure to listen to whether you agreed or disagreed, whether you, whether you knew all about what he was talking about or nothing about it, he never bored. He never exhausted. He was never trite. That was the magic of his voice. Keynes was a prolific contributor to daily newspapers, weekly magazines and learned journals. These articles were intended to have immediate influence on decisions and to alter short-term opinion. There was immediacy, responsiveness, and topicality in them. Though his journalism was ephemeral, its persuasiveness was enduring. Keynes's books, by contrast, were meant to be Reread. They defined first principles, characterized problems, posed questions, established models, and raised implications of enduring purposes. Purpose. Their eloquence was meant to be persuasive beyond time. The most famous of them, the economic consequences of the the economic consequences of the piece, which was published over 90 years ago, still resonates. It is Keynes's ad addressed. In it, Keynes addressed what he called the unusual, unstable, complicated, unreliable, temporary nature of a Europe's economic organization. Western economies, he emphasized, depended on their inequality of distribution of wealth and so on. Really, I mean, I've read enough, I've spoken quite about it. It's a must read. And maybe I will I'll read out something in praise of the book which has been written, uh, which I liked by J. Parini, author of uh, The Last Station or novel of Tolstoy's Final Years. So I'm going to read from there. Uh, John Maynard Keynes was indeed the central economist of the 20th century, a thinker of unimaginable breadth and influence. Keynes lived in the white-hot center 
It's written white hot center of British intellectual and social life in his times. And he seems never to have missed a moment to relish what lay at hand. In the superb hands of Richard Davenport Hines, one of the most gifted of critics, historians, and biographers had worked today, his large life quivers into being fully fleshed and deeply imagined. This book should attract a wide admiring audience. I for one have is and I if you read it you it's you will not be able to put it down. It's a beautiful biography. Go ahead, grab the book and read it. I've given the ISPN number two.